through Sunday school at Berean Baptist Church. Um, sure do miss seeing everybody's smiling face on a Sunday morning. Uh, Pastor and Brother David will have to do for now. I can only imagine uh, as I look out in this crowd, all the smiling faces that are normally here. Um, just want to thank thank all of you for the opportunity to do this. Many of the members of our church voted um, about a year ago to take on this endeavor of coming online. And um, God worked it out right in his timing for when we needed it most. So um, I just want to thank all those as well who donated even extra in order for this uh, ship to sail. So I just, uh, just want to thank them this morning as well. <clears throat> Turn in your Bible this morning to the book of Joel, chapter number three, the book of Joel, chapter number three. Um, I had an entirely different Sunday school lesson prepared in my mind of what I was going to do, and the Lord brought this one to my attention this morning, um, and it was something that I couldn't shake. So Joel chapter number three in your Old Testament, Joel is one of the minor prophets. Title of my lesson this morning would be Time to Decide. It's time to decide. Each one of us makes decisions every day. Every time we wake up, we make a decision. And usually before we go to bed at night, we've made many decisions during the course of that day. In Joel chapter number three, though, verse number nine, the Bible reads, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war, wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. And gather yourselves together round about thither, cause thy mighty ones to come down. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get ye down, for the press is full, the vats overflow. For their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall say, shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I ask now that it would be your Holy Spirit that would move this morning. Lord, use me to help others to make the decision that's right in their life. Each one of us, Lord, faces different decisions. Each one of us faces different obstacles. Each one of us has vices or things that affect us in our life. Each one of us, Lord, every day is in the valley of decision. Lord, I ask now that your Holy Spirit would move, that it would touch the hearts of those that are listening today, and that they would be filled with the power, Lord, the anointing that you've given them to be able to make the right decisions in each one of their lives. Now, Lord, even though we can't gather as a church, I ask, Lord, that you would just meet the needs of all those. I think of the faces as I pray to you, Lord. I think of each one that has health issues. I think of Bob, Edna, Harry, Fran, Marion. I think of Miss Bonnie. Lord, I think of Brother Phil, Croy's wife, Pat, and what she must be going through, Lord. Even though he was saved, it still hurts. Still hurts because there's a separation until you make things right. Lord, I just ask that you be with those I, that are in pain this morning in our church that physically have just been beaten down. Lord, I just ask that you would just touch the hearts of each one of the members, Lord, that I can think of this morning and those that I've missed. Lord, we, I'm sure, have many unspoken as we usually do. 
Lord, there's those that are hurting. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to be strengthened and that we would be able to decide to serve you a little bit more with our whole heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, normally on a Sunday morning Sunday school, we will take prayer requests. And if you um, put them on Facebook, send them to David um, through the church website, we can we can try to uh, put them online. Um, when we do our Wednesday night prayer, we can pray for them before we begin or at the end um, or before I begin Sunday school. But this morning, I want to talk about a time to decide. Every day, each one of us gets up and we decide how we're going to spend that day, where we're going to go, what we're going to do. We make decisions all day long. We choose to do things all day long. We decide what we're going to watch. We decide what we're going to listen to. We decide what books we're going to read if we read it all. We decide to read our Bible or we decide not to. Each one of us makes a decision when he or she wakes up every morning. We make a decision on what we're going to do with the time that's given to us in our life. Now, one of the things I want to talk about this morning before we break into our lesson is we as sound, saved, Bible-believing Christians need to make a decision this morning. This lesson this morning really isn't for the unsaved, but most Sunday school lessons aren't. Because this is a time when the, when the Christian needs to be strengthened. They need to eat a little bit of meat off the bone. So this morning, I want to talk a little deeper than normal. We need to, uh, we need to decide how we're going to live our life. And in some cases, some of us are deciding on how we're going to die because we've given up already. I've heard so many people over the years say, I'd lay down my life for Christ. I'd lay down my life for Christ, just like Peter said it. But how many of you today are willing to live your life for Jesus Christ? That's the decision you have to make this morning. Not whether you've already settled into your heart that you die for Christ. Why don't you live for him? Why don't you live for him today? Each one of us are faced with a valley of decision. The Bible calls it the Valley of Decision in verse number 14, and it also calls it the Valley of Jehoshaphat in verse number 12. But what I want you to notice this morning, make no mistakes, there are multitudes of people today in that valley. I had to decide this morning that I was going to get up, do what I needed to do to prepare to bring the Word of God to you this morning, and I still had to get in my car and come. I made decisions this morning made decisions this morning. And many of you have either decided to stay in bed, asleep, I'll watch it later, or many of you have joined us live and you've made that decision this morning. And I'll tell you right now, there's probably many of you out there when I'm talking about decisions, you've probably decided to stop watching. And you know what? If you're the kind of Christian who just likes to have a baby bottle, then stop watching because you're probably not going to like what the Bible has to say this morning. Pastor's throwing out the chop sign for cut the neck. <laughs> but let me tell you something this morning. There are multitudes of you that are going to be faced with the decision to stop or start watching. You know what? And by the way, if you decide to stop watching, you're not going to be the first one who's made that decision. Verse 14, the Bible says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. This word decision is really a unique word. Ironically, I thought when I came across this passage uh, doing another Bible study for what I thought I was going to teach this morning, I came across this word decision and I thought, well, that's interesting. So I typed it in on my iPad Bible. How many times the word decision is mentioned in your King James Bible? It is mentioned two times. Both times are in this verse, which I thought was interesting. Both times in this verse. Now, the thought of deciding or choosing is throughout the entire Word of God. Make no mistake. But this word decision is only located here. And it's ironic because this word of decision, it means the definition, a conclusion or resolution reached after consideration. After you consider what you're going to do, after you decide what the outcome can be, you make your decision. And there are millions and multitudes today that are making their decisions as we speak. Many. Another 
definition of the word is the act or process of deciding something or of resolving a question. We're faced with a question and how we decide to answer that question determines a lot. And I'm going to tell you this morning, Christian, your decisions matter. Your decisions matter because the world is always going to make the decisions the world always makes. There's always going to be opposition. There's always going to be people that decide to do the wrong thing. That's not really your problem. You have to decide what you're going to do. And when you look back, and I'm not a big going back into you know, the Greek or the Latin or all this, but it actually comes from the word, which means determine. Determine. It was a one word definition, determine. So you have to set it in your heart that you determine to make the right decision. Good decisions don't come by accident. You don't just so happen to fall in a good decision. You choose to make that good decision. I want to use an example in the Old Testament this morning. We're going to, well, we're already in the Old Testament, but I want to help you each decide this morning to make the right decisions because there's a lot of wrong decisions. There's a lot of decisions placed for you in front of you this morning and you'll decide wrong. Number one, before we go into the fir uh, first Kings, before we go into first Kings, I, I kind of wrote this little note here about verse number nine verse number nine through verse number 12. Let's just reread some of this again, because I just gonna, I'm just going to skip through because I want you to notice something. The Bible is pretty clear. Prepare for war. You're in a war. Whether you like it or not, you're at war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all men of war draw near. Let them come up. You know, this is, this is actually talking about the bad guys. This is actually talking about the heathen that are, that are preparing for war. Hey, Christian, you need to realize you're in a fight, and there's a lot of strong, mighty men gearing up against you. There's a lot of wickedness. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. And I want you to notice something. It also says that there is wickedness and it's great. So before we go back into 1 Kings, I want you to notice that the enemies prepared for war and the wickedness is great. And if we think about it in today, we would think that there's a lot of so-called mighty men out there, a lot of guys who are rearing up against a Christian, the true, the true Bible-believing Christian. There's a lot of wickedness that's trying to take us down and that we need to stand strong. The Bible says, he that thinketh he stand it, take heed lest he fall. You have to be determined to make the right decision. You don't accidentally stumble on to the right decision. So turn in your Bible, if you would, please. We're not going to turn back to Joel chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter number 22. 1 Kings 22. The Bible says, and these things happened as examples and were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world has come. That would be us. So these things that are in your Bible are there for our examples. So many people disregard two thirds of the Bible by throwing out the Old Testament. Oh, they'll read the Psalms for encouragement. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But guess what? Before you're there, you're going to walk through the valley of decision decision. So decide what you're going to do. Hey, guess what? Be determined to decide before it happens what you're going to do. See, at this time, there's a wicked King Ahab that's leading 10 of the tribes of Israel. 10 of the tribes, they later become the Samaritans. Verse number one in Chapter number 22, and they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye not that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle in Ramoth-Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art. 
My people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. You know, we need to be real careful, and I'm going to go further into this. When we go to make a decision in the Valley of Decision, we need to be careful where we get our advice. We need to be careful. We need to think really long and hard who we're listening to when we're listening to preachers or prophets. We need to think this through. See, there's 400 preachers that are telling the king of Israel and the king of Judah, and he's over the tribe of Benjamin and Judah and some of the Levitical priests. They're telling him, hey, go ahead, line up with this guy. You guys can go. You can get in there and you can win the battle. There's 400 preachers preaching the positive message today. And always we want to hear what we think. Well, we always want to hear what we think is the positive message, unfortunately. But you know what? The Word of God's not always filled with positives. There's a lot of things in here that many would consider negative. And, you know, the world today and many of the Christians today, they only want to eat the ice cream Sunday. They only want to have the hot fudge sickle. They only want to have their piece of cake, but they definitely don't want to chew on a bone or the meat of the word of God. They want to just sit there and act like everything's okay. And sure, go ahead. Go ahead, Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Go right on in and do what you want to do because God's with you. And they're going to make a decision based upon 400 of the popular preachers of the, of the day. Verse number seven, though. <clears throat> the Christian, I believe, that wants to make the right make the right decision has to dig a little deeper. Verse number seven in Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And I'll tell you right now, there's very few prophets of the Lord running around speaking and preaching what the Bible actually says. Many of them would never read out of this passage of God's word. Matter of fact, I can't tell you how many times I've not heard a sermon on this passage. I've heard more about Ephesians chapter 5 than I've heard anything. Or I've heard more about if you love me, feed my sheep. But you're not feeding the sheep and they're not making the right decision if you're not giving them the whole counsel of the word of God. Verse number eight, and the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, yeah, yeah, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imali, Imali, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, but I hate him. And unfortunately, people are making decisions today and they're saying, I am making the decision to hate the man of God who's going to preach the whole counsel of God. I hate him. He is not the one I want to hear. I want to hear your guy that comes on the radio and tells you everything's going to be okay. Kumbaya, sitting around a campfire, letting you think that everything, even as the world's falling apart around you and your family's falling apart around you and everything's falling apart and the country's falling apart and everything's going to pot and he's going to tell you, but everything's going to be all right because you don't want to hear what the real man of God says. Why? Because you hate him. You hate him. Unfortunately, too many today hate the Micaiahs of the world. Why? For he doth not prophesy good concerning me. Uh-oh. He doesn't prophesy good concerning you, but evil. But evil. Why? I'll tell you why. Ahab, because you and your wicked wife Jezebel just got done a few chapters back trying to kill Elijah the prophet. You didn't like him either. Why? Because he preached the truth. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. We have to decide as Christians today that when a guy is standing up preaching the Bible, the whole counsel of God, that we don't say, you know what, and with the other false prophets, I hate him too, because he always preaches a negative sermon. Look, he always preaches something that, that it's not the truth that I want to hear. But let me tell you something. Sometimes the truth can be a hard pill to swallow. It really can. I hate him. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. He's saying, come on, let's hear what he's got to say. And you know, 
it's like they, they don't like the man of God and, and they don't like the messenger. And, and really what it is, is, is they're mad at God. Jesus even said, hey, they hate you because they hated me first. Where did they hate him? From the very beginning. Verse number nine, then the king of Israel called another an, an officer and said, hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imelah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each, each on his throne, having put on their robes and avoid place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria and all the prophets prophesied before them. They said, you know what? It really don't, don't worry about the man of God who's coming. Let's just, we're just going to sit here and prophesy and preach to you and brainwash you so you make a bad decision. Unfortunately, too many in our churches today are making bad decisions because they're listening to the bad prophet or the bad preacher. Oh, he may say a few good things, right? He may say a few things that make sense. Hey, but listen to me this morning. A broke clock is right twice a day. And they're nothing but a bunch of broke clocks regurgitating the same thing over and over again, saying everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. Don't repent of your sins. Don't quit. Don't get right with God. Don't, don't just get that thing out of your life. It's just a little sin. Hey, why don't you ask yourself the question, was it just a little sin that sent Jesus to the cross or was it more than that? When you're thinking, hey, this is not a big deal. It's just a little sin. I struggle. I'm beat up. Hey, you get determined. You make a decision. Hey, that's not a little sin. It's a big sin and get it right and get rid of it. I don't think Jesus went to the cross for any little sins. Listen to this. Verse 11, And Zedekiah, the son of Shedaniah, made him horns of iron. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians and thou, until thou hast consumed them. Just like every false prophet and every childish little preacher, and I'm not against object lessons, but these guys are using them way too many. But, and, and, and that's just like Zedekiah. Hey, hey, you're going to believe me now because I went to this school and they taught me how to make a horn out of iron, and I'm going to show you how you could just push back the enemy and, and pay attention to me and not the Bible. And the, I know the man of God's coming, but you're not going to want to listen to him because he didn't get the right pedigree from the right university and he didn't learn what the Bible said, how in the world could he possibly teach you? I'll tell you why. Because he had an anointing from the Holy Spirit. And he needeth not that any man teach him. First John chapter number two. Look, I, I, we need to go to church. We need to have the preachers preaching and teaching. You need to go to Sunday school, but you need to be able to get in the word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Unto God. A workman, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Divide the Bible by the Bible. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Not man. This guy with his dumb object lesson. I'll show you what you're going to do to the Assyrians. Follow me. I'll teach you. And all the prophets, verse 12. All the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. Hey, go up. Go up and ask God to listen to you, because guess what? God's going to give it to you, regardless of how you're living. Regardless, right? But the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Listen, you can still be saved and have God's face against you based upon how you're living. King Jehoshaphat was a good godly king. You'll see that here in a minute. I like this too, because just like all these compromising preachers, they want to buddy up with the man of God and try to tell him what to say. And it's a compromiser who will just go along to get along. Verse 13, and the messenger that was gone to Micaiah spake unto him saying, behold, now the words of the prophets. Hey, he didn't say, behold, what's the Bible say? He didn't say, behold, the Holy Ghost said. He didn't say, behold, the Lord said. He said, hey, this is what the prophets declare. Good to the king with one mouth. One mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them and speak that which is good. Hey, 
this is a call to all you preachers. If by some chance you're listening and by some chance you feel that God has laid a sermon on your heart and it may go against the grain, you may be going upstream without a paddle. You may be going into the face of danger. You may be getting ready for a war. You better determine in your heart, you better preach what the Bible says and not what some man tells you what the Bible says or what someone tells you you need to preach. The man of God is going to trust into the Word of God and he's going to go out and preach it. I like what Micaiah says. Okay. And Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith to me, that, that will I speak. Verse 15, so he came to the king, came to the king. <clears throat> and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we forbear? And he answered him, go and prosper for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And you say, wait a minute. I thought he said he's going to say what the Lord said and not what the prophets say. But here's the funny thing. The king Ahab, he knows what he's doing. So King Ahab in verse 16, and the king said unto him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but what the Lord, but that which is true in the name of the Lord. See, the truth is hate to them that hate the truth. But even, even Ahab knew Micaiah wasn't being 100% honest at this time. He's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You never say anything good about me. Why now are you changing your tune? Why now have you decided to say what everybody else is saying? Verse 17, and he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have no shepherd. Oh, now comes the truth. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me, but evil, but evil. The man of God's not going to tell you all the time what you want to hear. Unfortunately, it'd be great if we could go through life and we could always hear what we want. And we could always hear the good news and never get the bad news. But for some reason, we'll go to the doctor and when he delivers bad news, we'll listen to him. Sometimes we'll go to our financial advisor and when he delivers the bad news, we'll listen to him. But when the man of God delivers the bad news, he's wrong. Maybe he's not wrong. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe you're not determined that you want to change how you're living. Maybe you've decided in the valley of decision that you just want to keep going the way you're going. That's on you. Verse 19, and he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail. Also go forth and do so. I'm going to chase a rabbit just a little bit. Here's the thing. If you're looking for a false prophet, you'll always find him. There's always a lying spirit. There's always a lying spirit wanting to go forth from the Lord. And I'll tell you right now, you better win your family to Christ right now because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, later on in that chapter, I can't remember if it was verse 18 or 19, it says, for this cause, God shall send a strong delusion. For this cause, what cause? Verse before it, that they love not the truth, that they might be saved. And God will send lying spirits. And the Antichrist will come with all signs and lying wonders. All signs. They won't be able to resist. Many on this earth will not be able to resist because not only is he a liar, but God will send the delusion. We need to be careful and determine what we believe now. We need to be determined to avoid a lying spirit. How can you tell if somebody's lying to you? Well, if they only stay in about 10 chapters of the Bible, they're probably lying to you. Well, he's just read, he's telling the truth. Hey, by not telling you the entire book, he's lying to you. 
He's lying to you. Why? Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge thee to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, rebuke, ex rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time shall come when they'll heap to themselves preachers having itching ears, and they'll be turned unto fables. Ahab did. What makes you think you're any better than Ahab if you only if you only are determined and you only decide that you're only going to hear what you want to hear and the other two-thirds of the Bible you're going to toss out to the curb? Who made you God to decide? Who made you God? You know, <clears throat> it's funny how... When you're up here preaching, sometimes you can get sidetracked. And as I'm thinking of these things, I've got 10,000 verses and passages running through my mind of deceptions that Christians have taken part in over the years and how back in the day preachers would preach on this sin or that sin because it was prevalent throughout the churches. People were battling with this. And then as you come into my generation and what they're battling with, and you come into the next generation, these children that, to me, their children are what they're battling with. And you can just see how the devil has prepared for war against you. And, the, and these things come into my mind and they just kind of haunt me, the deception that many of these so-called preachers that are are gathering together and they're heaping to themselves all these followers and and they just want to tell you what you want to hear and they want to placate you and make you happy to where you just go on your life and nothing bad's ever going to happen to you. I've heard so many Christians tell me, well, that's not my God. And I turn around and tell them, well, what God do you got? Because that's not the God of the Bible. My God would never let me. You fill in the blank. But Jesus, who's my God, said, all who live godly shall suffer persecution. They hated me, so they're going to hate you. You just have to decide who you're going to believe. Are you going to believe the whole counsel of God? Or are you going to throw out two-thirds of your Bible and believe what you want to believe? Because, you know, it's just, I think uh, crazy things come to my mind. I think of uh, the roadrunner. How many remember the Roadrunner? I don't even know if the young generations today even know what the Roadrunner is. But I think of the Roadrunner, and I think about how he'd always run, or run away from Wiley e. Coyote. And, and, you know, in Hebrews or uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, there's the wiles of the devil and all these tricks that the devil sends out. And, and you would always see the roadrunner racing and, and the coyote would always be behind him and, or, or Bugs Bunny or whoever the coyote would be trying to capture. And, and, and they both go off the cliff. Only the coyote would fall. Only the coyote, he always fell. And whether it was the roadrunner or whether it was Bugs Bunny, they would always say things like, well, I know that gravity should have taken place, but I never studied law. So therefore, they got away with it. But let me tell you something today, Christian. You're not going to get away with it. Just because you never studied the law. Just because you never studied your Bible. You're not going to get a get out of jail free card concerning these things. You're not going to get to escape the valley of decision because you decided in your mind you don't want to face the trouble. Hey, wake up today. There's always going to be trouble. How are you going to meet it? How are you going to meet it, though? Just because you never studied the Bible doesn't mean you're not accountable for what's in it. You're just as accountable. Matter of fact, as a Christian, you're more accountable. You're 10 times more accountable. You better read your Bible. We as Americans spend more time watching television, watching things we shouldn't watch. I got, I got a few extra minutes. I'm just going to go ahead and chase this rabbit while I got it by the tail. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number five. This has been weighing on me because I'm sick of hearing about all these perverts in the world. I'm sick of people and the way they talk. I'm sick of hearing it from Christians' mouths. I'm sick of it. Hey, guess what? If you're not ready to eat some meat, turn it off now because you're about to get convicted.
You should get convicted. This should convict you. Having your senses exercised. Verse number 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and, if, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Hey, that's pretty tough preaching from Jesus Christ. Jesus, the one who said, for God so loved the world. Hey, but I got news for you tonight, Christian. Instead of plucking your eye out, and we could read on, instead of cutting your hand off, why don't you just throw your television remote out the window? Why don't you get rid of your computer if it's causing you to sin? No, I, I got to do my job. Hey, get another job. That's far easier than plucking your eye out, I think. Because you know what the truth is? You're not going to pluck your eye out. You know what the truth is? You're not going to cut your hand off. You know what the truth is? You're still going to have your TV remote by your, by your easy chair as you sit and watch your easy life go by before your very eyes. Turn to Job. I got to find it. I Just go to Job for now. Um, I'm going to find the passage. 30-something. Job 31. Job 31. See, Jesus didn't bring anything new when he said that. Jesus didn't bring anything new out of the word of God. Hey, Christian, you better get your heart right before the Lord comes. Chapter 31, verse number one, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Why then should I think upon upon a mate. Hey, get your heart right. You need to make a covenant with your eyes. I've heard so many times, I've heard so many people say, hey, hey, just because I'm married, I can't look at the menu. But I'll tell you this right now, Christian, if you've already bought the dinner, the waitress takes the menu away. What's wrong with you? I can look at the menu. No, make a covenant with your eyes. Don't even think upon a maid because if you commit adultery in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Now that does not mean go out and commit adultery because you already thought about it. That means, hey, if you thought about it, get it right and get done. Determine in your heart that you're not going to do it again and you're going to fight that battle because the devil's strong. All these wicked things are strong and, and that's geared mostly at men, right? Mostly at men. Hey, young lady. Hey, old woman. I don't care who you are. Put some clothes on. You're just as guilty if you know you're dressing wrong. You're just as guilty because you're enticing people. You're dressing inappropriately. And I guarantee you right now, many have turned off this sermon. But those of you who are man and woman enough to determine in your heart, I want to hear what God's got to say. That's what he's got to say. And let's read on. For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance in Job 31 too, of the Almighty from high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity or if my foot hath hastened to deceit, hey, determine to walk uprightly. Let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know my integrity. If my step hath turned out of the way and my heart walked after my eyes, and if any blot hath cleaved to my hands. You know what? You need to be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above, looking down with love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. I don't care if your eyes are 80 years old. Be careful what you're looking at. Be careful. Oh, well, you know, I, I'm 80 and, and it doesn't matter. Hey, there's an 80-some-year-old pedophile in Rotunda. He got seized with over 7,000 files of child pornography. Pervert. 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 Be careful. Your eyes are the window to your soul, your heart. Then let me sow and let another eat, yet let my offspring be rooted out. Hey, you know what? I can't, 
here, here's what half the problem is. People will go into the Old Testament and butcher it up like the Mormons. They'll say, oh, King David had multiple wives. Deuteronomy 17, 17 said not to multiply wives, but he did it anyway. But what the parents do in moderation, the children will do in excess because then you got King Solomon. And what did he do? We need to... You, be careful. Your kids are watching you. My heart have been deceived by a woman or for to lay wait at my neighbor's door. Then let my wife grind unto another. Hey, you know what? If, if, if you think you're going to just get away with adultery, guess what? Your wife's going to go marry a real man. She'll go grind at another's. She'll go make that guy breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She'll go be an asset to that family. She'll say, you know what, pervert? I've had enough. I'm gone. It could happen, and it does happen every day. For this is a heinous crime, yea, it is iniquity to be punished by the judges. Remember what Jesus said he's going to judge? Joel chapter number 3. He's going to trot out the wine press. Oh, don't judge. Hey, you better, if you don't want to be judged, judge yourself then. To see if ye be found in the way. Oh, I can't get victory over it. Well, you know why you can't get victory over it? Because you're watching movies. And if you're watching movies that have people scantily clad or dressed inappropriately or half naked, quit watching the movie. Oh, but where's my entertainment? Uh, read the Bible. Go walk your dog. Exercise. Do something. Do something other than sit there and watch that filth. Well, yeah. You've determined and you've made your decision what you're going to do. So when some other man marries your wife who's left you because you couldn't be faithful, don't come crying to God because she made her decision in that valley as well. She determined in her heart that she can't sit there any longer. Verse 12, for it is a fire that cometh to destruction and would root out all my increase. You know, <clears throat> I've known a lot of people that have been divorced over these things and a lot of people that have broken up and gone their own way. And, you know, here, here, here's the truth. It becomes a fire in the home and the kids usually suffer and the kids are torn apart. And then it ends up coming back to destroy what little bit of wealth you had. Why? Because you're paying alimony, because you're paying child support. And you should. You should. You know, I I always said I always said this. People people were like when and I'm going to use this guy as an example because he's I guess famous, somewhat. Uh, Jeff Bezos, Bezos, whatever his name is, the guy from uh, uh, almost Amazon. I almost said Google. Um, he and his wife got divorced, and uh, um, you know everybody said, "Oh boy, she's going to get." She's going to get all this money, and he worked so hard for it. Hey, let me tell you something, young man, old man, whatever man you think you are, you are nothing without your wife. Nothing. The Bible says, he who findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. God Almighty allowed him to make that money, and his wife was a part of it. You can't stay faithful? Determine in your heart you will. Determine in your heart your will. Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29. That's been weighing on me for a while. Now that we have a platform, now we can know. Now you know where I stand. I'm not perfect. I'm a man, but I've determined in my heart that I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes that I should not think upon a maid. That's what the Bible says tonight, today. But see, these false pre preachers, um, a verse comes to my mind, 2 Peter chapter 2, having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. When your preacher just sits there and makes a joke at it, sits there and watches the same, here we go. Christian, I'm not against football. I didn't see the football uh, Super Bowl thing this year, but I heard about the halftime show, and any, God, any godly man worth his weight in salt is going to toss that remote out, and he's going to say, I'm done with the NFL, and they, until they start putting some sanctions on these halftime shows. 
Why? Because the devil's prepared for war. He's built up an army of mighty men. And just like the world, they'll say things like, oh, you're just mad because... No, I'm mad because it's wicked. Wicked. Amen. It's abomination. I thank God I didn't watch it. But I determined in my heart a long time ago I was never going to. I determined in my heart years ago when I picked up this book, I put down that remote. When I picked up this book and went through it for the last 12 years, I decided that is my valley of decision and I made my choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30. I don't have time to go into the other one. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse number 17. But if thy heart turn away, so will thou not hear. But shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. Hey, look, if you're serving yourself, you're serving your flesh, you've made yourself a God. Oh, no, I, I, I serve the Lord. You've made yourself a God and you're it. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Hey, Christian, you are choosing the way of death when you're not putting sanctions on the stuff that's brought into your home. You are not, you are not making good decisions. Choose life. Choose life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I know that some of these things are a hard saying, but we need to prepare for war. The devil has. The devil has come in to destroy our homes, and men need to be men. Men need to love their wives, love their children, love their parents, love their grandparents, love everybody in their family. Lord, we need to be careful because there's a lot of deception out there, a lot of wickedness, a lot of filth. But we've been so desensitized, Lord. Help us to make a decision today to choose you this day whom we will serve. I choose to serve you, Lord. I want life, and I want it more abundantly. I love this life. I love life. I love, and I tell people to hold on to their life. It's important. Don't choose death. It can be a spiritual death. It can be a physical death. Be careful, Christian, what you get involved in. God says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but make no mistake, he's just and true, and he'll judge it. He'll judge it. Read the book of Hebrews. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Lord, be with our church. Strengthen them. A lot of people are sitting around, not a lot to do. Temptation can meet them. Lord, just forgive us as a nation, a people, and a church. Forgive me as well, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, we lost you.